Minister. Order of the day number four, government business be postponed until the later hour this day. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Order of the day number five, appropriation bill number one, 1990, 1991. Second reading, resumption of the budget debate. The Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The budget brought down by the Treasurer on Tuesday night showed just how out of touch the Hawke-Keating government has become. Yeah. They clearly have no idea of the extent of the recession in the private sector in Australia, nor the hardship now being experienced by the great bulk of Australians. The budget failed to address our debt and our inflation problem. It has therefore left our nation even more exposed to the growing uncertainty in the world economy, which risks even more hardship for us all. In the circumstances, I honestly cannot believe that the government could get away, think it could get away, with the sort of budget it brought down. It is simply not good enough. The budget must be redone. It must be redone with a package of essential measures that I will outline tonight. Yeah. Why has the government shown so little resolution? This was the first budget of a new three-year term of the parliament. It was an opportunity to take some tough decisions. It was an opportunity to frame a strategy appropriate to the most difficult economic circumstances in Australia since the Second World War. The government clearly has no vision for our country in the 1990s. They clearly live in a different world to the rest of us. It's a world that's riddled with division and disunity, factional squabbles, leadership ambitions, and dominated by Bill Kelty and the ACTU. It is a world where, the government, where government is a matter of deals, deals with union bosses, deals with greenies, deals with ethnic groups, deals with business, deals with factions and other sectional interests, rather than as a matter of policies in the best interests of the people of Australia. They want to know what they should have done. The Prime Minister and the Treasurer should get out of Canberra, as I have done, and talk to a wide cross-section of Australians. Get away from their Treasury boffins, who have got their economic forecasts so wrong. Get away from the J-curve and the twin deficits and the imp implicit price deflators, not even I can say those, and the rest of the models, levers and jargon. They should simply get out and talk to the people of Australia. Get out and talk to some of those 100,000 people who have lost their jobs just since last October, or the thousands and thousands more who are about to join them. Get out and talk to the record number of small business people that have gone broke as a result of the Treasurer's high interest rates. People whose life savings have been lost and who will take years to repay their debts. Get out and talk to those struggling to buy a home with 16% mortgage interest rates, or to those who are forced to sell their house in a falling market. Get out and talk to those families whose spouses have been forced to go to work just to pay the mortgage bill or to pay the supermarket bill. Walk up and down any street in any city, suburb or town and count the empty shops, the for sale signs, the auction columns and the growing gold queues. Get out and talk to the manufacturers or the farmers or the miners who are trying to compete overseas, but always with at least one hand tied behind their back because of an uncompetitive exchange rate, high interest rates, excessive transport costs, excessive waterfront and shipping charges, excessive government regulation of red tape, black bands, go slows, stop work, labour market deals that are totally unrelated to their particular workplace or their particular operation. Or go out and talk to the genuinely needy in Australia, the sick, the aged, the generally unemployable, who have left, who have to get by on less because of others who could otherwise pull their weight in our society have been ripping off the welfare system. And it's a welfare system which makes it easier to put your hand out than to help yourself or to lift your game. Well, get out and talk to some of those 500,000 Australians, many of them in their retirement years, whose savings have been frozen when a building society or a property trust has gone bust. Or well, talk to the workers, those who had thought that a Labor government would look after their interests, only to find out that their wages are squeezed and more than clawed back by higher inflation, higher interest rates, and of course the Treasurer's bracket creep. Or finally, get out and talk to the youth of Australia, who have little to look forward to except decades of high real interest rates, higher taxation, shrinking job opportunities, and increasing difficulty in buying a home and in raising a family. And then after all that, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer should come back and redo the budget 
and this time get it right. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, the government will not heed this advice because it will not admit that its high interest rate policy is not working and that it needs to change direction. Our debt, our balance of payments, inflation, interest rates and unemployment numbers might be, to quote the Treasurer, beautiful numbers to him, but for the rest of Australians they stand as monuments to his policy failures. Australians want policies, not excuses. They want problems solved, not denied, not ducked, not rationalised away. The facts are simple. Mr Keating high interest rates will not work. They inflict real pain for little gain. They have pushed the private sector into recession, even on his forecast, and it is expected to stay in recession. They have created the record levels of personal bankruptcies, small business failures, falling living standards, and so on. The high interest rates clearly squeeze business, and business investment has now collapsed at a time when it was most needed. Yet our inflation and our balance of payments problems persist. Indeed, high interest rates have made the, the balance of payments and inflation worse, not better. They keep our exchange rate well above its long-term competitive level, encouraging imports and discouraging exports when we need the reverse. The bottom line is the magnitude of our international debt and inflation problems. We presently owe about $150 billion and it's rising rapidly. And our inflation is still close to 8%, roughly twice as high as in the countries with which we compete. Our debt problem is approaching the proportions of the 1930s and paying interest on it is a problem for all Australians. So Mr Prime Minister and Mr Treasurer, how many more businesses will have to fail? How many exports will have to be choked off? How many more people will have to go broke? How many more people will be have, to have to be added to the dole queues before the Treasurer admits that his policies ain't all that beautiful? The fundamental challenges to policy are therefore to get our inflation and our debt under control. We face only two options. The first, to continue to cut our standard of living. Or the second, to boost our production, our productivity and our exports. We should all be particularly concerned at just how readily the Prime Minister and the Treasurer have accepted the first option and eroded our living standards. By contrast, the Coalition favours the second option of boosting our production and our exports so that our standard of living can improve and our job, op job opportunities can increase. However, it's important to recognise the magnitude of the policy task that is before us. Over time, we must aim to eradicate inflation through the pursuit of an explicit and stable medium-term framework for monetary, for fiscal and for wages policy and an accelerated program of industry reform that emphasises competition, deregulation, incentives to work, to save and to invest. And if we are to stabilise our foreign debt by, let's say, 1995, we need nearly 4% of our production to be shifted into exports. And that's not going to reduce our debt. It'll just have it grow no faster than what we produce. Now, the enormous scale of this task is demonstrated when it is realised that we have not had anything like a 4% shift in net exports in any five-year period since 1945. And indeed, even if we matched our best performance of the post-war period, we will not see our debt stabilised this decade. The Hawke-Keating government has barely scratched the surface of this policy task. They simply don't have the policies, they simply don't have the capacity to carry it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This budget provided a unique opportunity to change the direction of overall economic policy. The budget is of course only part of a package that should have been put in place if we are to turn our economy around. But it is an important part and it should do three things. First, it should cut government spending instead of using interest rates to cut private spending. Two, it should reshape our tax system to restore incentives and remove the bias against our export industry. Yeah, and three, yeah. it ought to boost national savings. The 1990-91 budget fails on all three accounts. While the Treasurer has been at pains to convince everyone that it's a tough budget, it clearly is not. While not denying that there are some commendable attempts while not denying that there are some Order. commendable attempts to cut Order. spending in particular areas, 
These have been undone by increased spending in other areas. Total budget outlays are increasing in real terms and the Commonwealth's own expenditure, the real test, that is excluding the payments it makes to the state, has actually jumped by 2 to 3 per cent in real terms. Indeed, the budget only cuts expenditure by $350 million from the forward projection. That $350 million in a budget of $93 billion. That is only 0.4 per cent. It clearly does not slash welfare spending either, as the Treasurer would have us believe. Social security and welfare spending is to rise by 12.3 per cent this year, or by 5.7 per cent in real terms. That is the biggest increase since 1983-84. To be clear, I'm not advocating slamming welfare. But I am in favour, I am in favour, I am in favour of making sure that spending reaches those who really need it. For the, tre for the Treasurer's fraudulent description, the Treasurer's fraudulent description of the termination of the dole only saves $80 million out of a total payment to the unemployed of about $4 billion a year. Our proposal, our proposal to limit the dole to a period of nine months would save an additional $600 to $700 million. Yet our scheme ensures that those who are unemployed Order. have a financial incentive to return Order. to the workforce rather than simply holding out their hand. And it also provides a special benefit beyond the nine month period to those that are genuinely unemployable. There should be no doubt that Mr Keating's claims about restraint on government spending are indeed fallacious. And his forecasts admit this. Total public sector spending will grow significantly faster than national production this year by 2.75%. While Mr Keating would have us believe otherwise, the size of government is still a very live issue in Australia. Second, the budget fails to address the issue of reshaping our tax system and again merely tinkers at the edges rather than addresses the problem. In the tax area, we of course must do a number of things with the system that's there now. We must reduce the overall tax burden, and that can only be done by cutting expenditure. We outlined over $3 billion worth of cuts in our economic action plan that is many multiples of what you have achieved in this budget. And we must simplify the personal tax system and lower tax rates. We must ensure that the government does not continue to get a windfall tax gain every year simply because it fails to control inflation. That is, Mr Keating's bracket creep. In this budget, the government only gives back $1.2 billion in tax cuts, or roughly half what the Treasurer took through bracket creep last financial year, and in giving it back, he still even cribs another six months as the tax cuts don't start under January of next year. And it should be realised that we're now approaching a point where inflation will push the average income earner into, into the top tax bracket. We must also achieve a shift in the burden of taxation away from income towards consumption in order to encourage savings and provide scope for the elimination of various taxes on export and business input. Yeah, yeah. The opposition, unlike the government, has made a clear choice in favour of such tax reform in backing a goods and services tax as an essential part of a reshaped tax system. In adopting a GST, the opposition is committed to lowering overall tax, which it will achieve by cutting expenditure. We are committed to compensating low income earners and pensioners and providing substantial tax cuts to workers. One of the major advantages, one of the major advantages of a shift in the tax mix is that individuals will be given the money back in their pocket and they can decide how much tax they, p they pay when they buy. And we will completely abolish the wholesale sales tax system, a system which is grossly unfair, inefficient, and taxes business inputs and exports. Tax cheats, of course, in the black economy, and some tourists will indeed pay more tax. But everybody should be clear that the Treasurer will undoubtedly mount a massive scare campaign on this tax shift. But it should not be forgotten that he gave all the reasons during the 1985 tax summit of why such a reform is necessary and appropriate. The fact is that he is now disowning them to try and score some cheap political points and that should not obscure the fact that he was right the first time around. In thinking about the goods and services tax, 
People should also remember the phenomenal cuts in living standards, increases in tax, record interest rates, rising unemployment and debt that Mr Keating has inflicted on them over the last seven years. Let Mr Keating play his cheap politics, but his economic titanic is on the way down. Third, the budget does not boost, uh, does nothing to, to boost savings, either directly in the public sector or indirectly, by creating the circumstances in which the private sector might save more. For the second time in two years, this budget promises no increase in total public sector savings. The Commonwealth surplus is to be broadly offset by deficits in the state. However, the overall budget could well lead to a sizeable fall in national savings because the Treasurer's surplus is exaggerated. His growth forecasts are particularly optimistic and we are yet to see the budget for the state. Finally, it should be recognised that this budget is built on shallow and facile optimism and what will prove to be unrealistic assumptions. The Treasurer has an appalling record of forecasting the main economic indicators. This budget will continue, uh, this budget will ensure, sorry, that he maintains that record. For example, how will the Treasurer meet his electoral commitment to stabilise our foreign debt by 1992 when he does nothing to boost national savings, which is essential to reduce our reliance on foreign savings? How can the 2% forecast growth rates in our economy be achieved when the private sector is already in recession and the world economy is slowing down? How will a more substantial increase in unemployment be avoided in such circumstances? And on what basis did the Treasurer arrive at the highly optimistic estimate of $23 a barrel for oil for 1990-91, when most other professional estimates are significantly higher? The answers to these and other questions are crucial. If the Treasurer's unjustifiably optimistic assumptions turn out to be mistaken, as I believe they will, then the whole budget strategy on wages, interest rates, foreign debt, living standards and unemployment will fall apart. That's just how spongy the, fig the figuring in this budget is. Now apart from the budget and the need to cut government spending and to reshape our tax system, there are a number of other key elements for an effective package of measures to turn our economic situation around. This budget is a donut budget. It's got a big hole right through the middle. And what's missing are the main elements of an economic reform package which the Treasurer has not been able to put together. The deal-doing Treasurer has failed to do the deals that really matter. Labor market reform, reductions in industry protection, privatisation, efficient infrastructure and striking a balance between development and the environment. Let me consider each of these elements of a more detailed package in turn. Our labour market is not really a market at all. Wages are determined by the ACTU leadership and the Treasurer. Employers are, of course, excluded. The centralised process produces wage increases that apply across the board, irrespective of the conditions or the strength of particular firms or industries. As such, this process is anti-productivity, it's anti-competitiveness, and it has a basic thrust to protect better, better jobs at the expense of others. To be specific, the government's accord and the centralised wage fixation system have four major failings. First, they've produced uncompetitive wage outcomes year after year. Second, they've put a floor of about 6% under our rate of inflation. Thirdly, they've provided the means by which Bill Kelty has achieved de facto cabinet status, such that he can almost have a veto power over any reform which might reduce his power or affect the jobs of a few of his mates. And finally, they have, looked, they have failed to look after the workers, their principal constituency. Wages have been consistently eroded by inflation and job opportunities have been lost. As such, the Accord is part of our problems rather than a solution to our problems. The only viable alternative is to move away from the centralised system with an increasing focus on workplace negotiations and enterprise bargaining to determine wages and conditions. This is the essential element of the coalition's industrial relations policy. We are not anti-union, as unions can represent workers in the workplace, but prefer preferably one union per workplace. And they won't be an arm of government, and they will not run government policy under us. Yeah. It's the only way we will get internationally competitive wage outcomes, which will be tied to performance and genuinely protect the interests of workers. Order. A coalition government will implement sweeping industry reform so that by the year 2000 there will be little justification for pervasive industry protection. 
It is essential to see the proposed reductions in protection as part of a total package of reform measures. To simply cut protection in isolation, of course, will only serve to drive firms out of existence. But reductions in protection under a coalition government will firstly apply to all forms of protection in all industries, including passenger motor vehicles and the textile, clothing and footwear industry. Yeah, yeah. Second, they'll be phased and predictable, so that by the year 2000, protection levels will be at most negligible. And three, they'll be relatively larger at the top end to eliminate the gap between highly protected sectors and the remainder of the manufacturing industry. Now, there's virtually no disagreement now, even among industry, that protection imposes massive costs on consumers and producers who do not receive assistance. The fact is, protection of one local industry must be paid for by another. Exporters who cannot pass on increased costs are penalised by higher input prices as well as increased labour and capital costs. The overall burden on the domestic economy in terms of higher prices and jobs and exports foregone is very high. The Coalition has a firm commitment also to break down the sleepy, inefficient government monopolies through privatisation and through the introduction of competition. We have a comprehensive program to privatise major government-owned business enterprises, including the airlines and telecoms. Mm -hmm. We see no reason why a government should run airlines or banks or any other businesses. Government, owned, government ownership imposes constraints on which, of which other businesses are free. As a result, the Coalition views privatisation as important to remove these enterprises from the day-to-day -day government interference, from cabinet decision-making processes, and to boost their capital base. It also enables the achievement of wider share ownership and especially among employees currently only the province of the rich. In contrast, the government will never be able to implement full privatisation because its left wing won't let it. At the moment, the government is busy trying to dress up some shonky deal to sell 49% of government enterprises as if it's genuine privatisation. They are not interested in genuine efficiency gains. They simply see it as a way of tapping more money for various public sector projects not as a means of boosting efficiency or lowering costs to consumers. There's also a pressing need to eliminate all the cost disadvantages that we suffer in a host of our inefficient and uncompetitive industries. Most importantly in telecommunications, in road and rail transport, in aviation, shipping and of course on our waterfronts. Let me just cite a few examples. In telecommunications, for example, as an indication of the low level of productivity in telecom, telecom employees handle 88 main lines compared to 202 in the United States, 177 in Italy, and 162 in France. Not surprisingly, therefore, it's estimated that effective competition in telecommunications could reduce prices by about 15% on average across the board to telecom customers. What about the waterfront? In Singapore, they can turn around a container ship in five to six hours, the entire ship. Takes five to six days in a country like Australia. And that would be on a good week where there's no black bands, no work to rules, no go slows, no quarantine problems and so on. In shipping, for example, it is $60 per car cheaper to ship a Ford Capri from Melbourne to the west coast of the United States using a foreign flagship than it is to ship the same Ford Capri from Melbourne to Tasmania using an Australian coastal ship. And while Australia is a major salt producer and we export salt from South Australia and Western Australia, it's cheaper for our East Coast chemical companies to import that salt from Mexico than to ship it around the coast from South Australia or Western Australia. And I could go on, there are hundreds of examples. But the elimination of these sorts of cost disadvantages will be fundamental to Australia becoming an effective trading nation. In most cases, these disadvantages arise from a lack of competition, but in some cases they are due to inefficient work and management practices and a government red tape. The effect is clear. Even if you are a super competitive by international standards, farmer or miner or manufacturer, at the farm or in the mine or in the plant, you can still become internationally quite uncompetitive as you try to move your goods, either store them, move them by rail or air, clear them through the waterfront or put them on a ship. But rather than address these issues, let me just focus briefly on one subject of current debate, namely telecommunications. The government is virtually tearing itself apart with open warfare between the Beasley and the Keating options. Daily newspapers abound with references to Megacom and Monstercom and a whole host of other versions of, the, of those uh, megalomania, yes. However, the real issue here is not size, it is competition. 
Simply merging telecom and OTC with OSAT as the basis of a new major competitor or merging OTC and OSAT as a competitor tele to telecom will contribute little to improved competition. Only real competition will give all Australians what they want, namely lower prices for telecommunication services and more reliable and efficient service. The various two competitor or duopoly options just won't deliver. The government should have realised this from its, its experience with its two airline policy and the two phone policy will not be any better. The coalition's policy, the coalition's policy on telecommunications released this week is designed to achieve full and effective competition. Potential competitors in telecommunications will be allowed to apply for licences to compete in the entire field or in specific areas of telecommunications. The opposition also supports the complete privatisation of telecom, ODC and OSAT within that framework of full and effective competition. We believe telecommunications policy, our telecommunications policy is the only way of effectively achieving cheaper telecommunications charges for all Australians. Finally, we must settle on clear and consistent guidelines to achieve an appropriate balance between development and conservation of the environment. Only by clear guidelines, consistently applied in the national interest, can we get truly sustainable development. More than half the investment projects planned for Australia, which could generate foreign exchange earnings, are currently in danger of a veto on environmental grounds. Access Economics estimates this amounts to over $15 billion worth of investment. This unacceptable situation exists because this government has preferred to deliberately use environmental issues for its own short-term political purposes and has failed to spell out clear environmental standards which would need to be met. And to be clear, once those environmental standards are set, the project should go ahead if the standards are met. Pulp Mill should be built, Coronation Hill should be mined, the Cape York Spaceport should be approved. Yeah. Mr Speaker, this budget fails to address the deep concerns of Australians about their future. It does nothing to address the problems, absolutely nothing to address the problems that w which make our economy so vulnerable, namely high inflation and high debt. What this do government doesn't seem to understand, what this government seems to have no idea about, is that most Australians would rather be told the truth. They would rather take the medicine and get on with the cure. The nation is looking for leadership on the long road to recovery in this budget, but the government has shown it, uh, itself totally incapable and, and unwilling to meet that challenge. There is only one way for the Prime Minister and the Treasurer to redeem themselves, and that is to go back to the drawing board and take some really tough decisions for once in their life, instead of just talking about it, and come back to this Parliament with a budget that will do the job for Australia. Yeah. And if they don't, let history judge them as the men who fritted away Australia's chances through the 1980s and didn't have the guts to make the hard decisions for the 1990s. The coalition policies have clearly set out a course of a new direction for Australia. Our alternative strategy based on a concerted attack on inflation through reform of the tax system, labour market deregulation, more competition, privatisation and consistent policies to ensure sustainable development. These must be the real objectives of the 1990s if Australians are to enjoy rising living standards once again. Is the only strategy, and I emphasise the only strategy, to trade our way out of the debt trap into which Labor has let Australia slide. Australians deserve the chance of something better. What we need now is vision. What we need now is courage. What we need now is to harness all the energy and determination of the Australian people to reach our objective of making Australia once again a significant economic force in our region, a strong Australia that can hold its head high. Tonight I want to assure the Australian people that the coalition parties are committed, firmly committed, to giving them just that. Yeah. The Honourable...